Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the second PowerPoint for Unit 7. We're going to go into the interwar period. So we ended with Wilson's 14 points, and that's going to lead into the League of Nations. This was founded in 1919. It had 58 members. The goals, you could see, were collective security, disarmament, diplomacy, and cooperation. Uh, despite the fact that our president came up with this great idea, our Senate does not approve it. We do not join it. The problems of the League of Nations was that there was no armed forces behind it, and essentially it could only boycott or place sanctions. That became a huge issue. It's going to end in 1946. It will be replaced by the United Nations. So here we have the mandate, which means a status for certain territories transformed from the control of one country to another following World War I. So Germany's former land holdings are going to be given away thanks to the Treaty of Versailles. So here you see the British mandates, the French mandates, and the Belgian mandates. So we really want to talk a little bit about West African resistance to French rule during World War I. Uh, it's going to keep going on afterwards, just so you have this in your, you know, your knowledge banks. In French West Africa, they moved their troops out for the war effort, uh, leaving the country open to challenge. So in late 1915, 11 villages um, in current day Burkina Faso, uh, Burkina Faso, sorry, uh, throughout 1916, they waged war against the French, and in response, the French employed a scorched earth policy. French declared victory in February of 1917. The population is going to continue to fight and flee the region, causing an agricultural input to fall. Um, the, so it's good to know these things, that they, they still had all this control, but the people there are going to start to fight. That's going to lead into our next unit, Unit 8. When we talk about decolonization. So just know that during this time, uh, the people are going to start to see weaknesses in their imperial overlords, essentially, and go, okay, maybe we can start to fight back. Um, you also want to know about the Indian National Congress. We know that it was started in 1885, but Gandhi is going to become president in 1915 and use civil disobedience to fight for rights for the Indians. Originally, he wanted what is known as home rule, which is like Greenland today and how they're, they're governed under Denmark, but eventually they're going to push for complete independence against British imperial rule in the 1940s, and they will get independence from British rule. So these are things that you want to know. Um, they're in your study guide, so kind of look back on those and, and have them in your, your knowledge banks. Here we go. So in 1946, the responsibilities of the League are going to be handed over to the United Nations. United Nations member states had to turn over armed forces to serve as peacekeepers. And of course, the United States is going to join. We have a quote here by Adolf Hitler. As long as the League of Nations constitutes only a treaty of guarantee for the victorious nations, it is by no means worthy of its name. So the global depression is going to occur. German reparations totaled to about $450 billion. So as a result, they're going to print more money, which causes hyperinflation. And the U.S. in 1929, about half of the world's goods were actually produced here. But we're going to have credit expanding. The banks are going to loan too much money, and the people can't pay those loans back. So the banks are going to close, and there's no uh, security for your money. So you would go to grab your money back, and they say, we don't have it. There's no money here. We're also going to have high tariffs, the term protectionism. It means the taxes on imports, so the United States dollars would stay here in the United States. That's going to backfire because countries are going to impose their own high tariffs, and global trade is going to decline by about 65%. Don't worry, we'll go over more of this in class with some activities we've got planned, so don't freak out if some of this is not making all that much sense, but of course, write down questions. We can go over it before and after class. A lot of you are are already aware of this, this global depression, the stock market crash of 1929, the market's going to fall approximately 22%. We lose about $30 billion. It doesn't return back to its peak until around 1954. There are bread lines formed by 1930 as big companies lose 25% of their value, and there are millions and millions unemployed. So here you can look at the way the numbers kind of peak after 1930. We really don't have a dip until 1945 when it drops again because that's when the war is really going strong in the United States. So everyone's got to go to work. 
we have another uh, peak over in the 1980s. And when we get to that period, you'll start to understand why. And of course, another peak around 2010, that's when we kind of had a recession hit. All these different peaks happen when, you know, the recessions occur and there's problems with our stock market. But of course, the largest one was the stock market crash. So during the Great Depression, the government's going to take a more active role in the economic life. And this is the New Deal, which was a series of programs, public works projects, financial reforms, and regulations enacted by FDR between 1933 and 1939. Not all were successful, but some are still going today. Uh, you know, the Social Security, that's still going around. So kind of a big deal. And they really did kind of help America get out of the hole. Well, granted, the war really, really helped America get out of the hole. This kind of started us getting out. So you really kind of want to know some of these guys. They're not the, the most happiest of people, but you really definitely want to know who they are. And you want to be able to associate them with each country. So you have Benito Mussolini, he's for Italy, Joseph Stalin for USSR, Adolf Hitler for Germany, and Hideki Tojo for Japan. These are our dictators. Um, they're the ones we're going to talk about. So let's start with Mussolini. He is a former uh, journalist, leader of the National Fascist Party, and prime minister of Italy from 1922 to 1943. Uh, he actually, they, he kind of kept it democracy, but at a certain point in 1925, he just got rid of it and said, no, we're a dictatorship. I'm not even going to lie to you anymore. He established a group known as the Black Shirts, which was a paramilitary group. Um, he established them in 1919 in order to fight the socialists. And he does what is known as the March on Rome in October of 1922. This was how he ascended to power. On October 29th, the king actually appoints him as prime minister as a means to transfer power to the fascists without armed conflict. He, it's reported that he could have had around 200,000 black shirts with him. Um, in this invading Ethiopia, the reason you really want to know about this, this was the second Italo-Ethiopian War. Um, it was October 1935 to February of 1937. This shows their expansionist policy and the weakness of the League of Nations, because this is prior to World War II. And essentially, they were getting away with what they wanted to get away with, and nobody was able to stop them. And you had this group of 58 nations, and they couldn't stop him from invading. So you have that he was a radical authoritarian. He had a nationalistic political ideology. He believed that war and violence are going to promote and create this national spirit. So if you've got war and you keep winning, you're going to be proud of your country. And he also had this idea of what is known as corporatism. It's a political ideology which advocates the organization of society by corporate groups. And these corporate groups are groups like agriculture, labor, military, scientific, or guild associations on the basis of their own common interests. So to simplify that, think of society as a body. And then each division, so your agriculture, your labor, your military, so on and so forth, is an organ that needs to work perfectly for society to work perfectly. So that's what you can think of as corporatism in this sense. So he promotes businesses, not labor unions. And remember, he is opposed to democracy. He does not like socialism. He does not like communism. And he does not like liberalism. So he is a fascist. Then we have Adolf Hitler. He is nationalistic. He has a strong government. He calls himself the Fuhrer. He is anti-minority. He is anti-democratic. He's anti-communist. He's very pro-military. He was a member of the military during World War I. And he believes there's a hierarchy of race. He takes the term Aryans. And he uses it as the master race. And we will go over different uh, propaganda pieces and class. And you will see propaganda pieces that they had and propaganda pieces the U.S. had, of course, just to kind of see the terrible caricatures, as you can see here on the right, of the Bolshevik leaders that he had, um, asserting that Bolshevism is a Jewish ideology. So there are plenty of films, of course, I can always suggest that you could watch. Um, just to really kind of explore this a little bit more, but many of you already have a background knowledge of Hitler. So for Tojo, 
Uh, he was made prime minister in 1941. He led attacks into Manchuria, Mongolia, China, and Vietnam for their raw materials, uh, much like the West had done before. And then the U.S. actually is going to cut off Japan's supply for oil and metal. Um, Roosevelt actually ordered the U.S. to freeze all Japanese assets in the United States. He closes the Panama Canal to Japanese shipping and forbade the export of oil, iron, and rubber to Japan. And he is essentially responsible for the Pearl Harbor attack. Uh, this one's an extra dictator. It's always kind of good to have an extra one. If you have knowledge of the Spanish general, Francisco Franco, it's good to have it. Um, if it's completely new to you, it's good to read about him. And he's probably going to show up in some of your books. Just kind of look him over. Obviously, if you've got Hitler in your knowledge bank, use him as an example. But you know, here's an extra one. So this was the Nationalist versus Royalist in the Spanish Civil War. Obviously, he's a nationalist. He's going to take power after winning the Civil War. And he is supported by Hitler and Mussolini. And then Picasso here painted this painting called Guernica. And you can look it up. It's a really famous painting. It's going to commemorate the victims of a bombing raid on the civilians. All right, we're going to go into World War II. This is 1939 to 1945. So the reasons, well, the Treaty of Versailles, it was unsustainable. There was a global economic crisis. There were imperialist aspirations. Uh, there was nationalism in Japan, Italy, Germany, and the fascist regime, regimes. And of course, Adolf Hitler's aggressive militarism. Uh, we can talk about this a little bit more in class as well. It wasn't as if he came to power immediately and said, so let's kill everyone. Let's burn all the books. So he came to power because many Germans didn't have jobs because of the global depression. And he was able to say, you know, we're going to get you jobs. We're going to solve our problems. We're going to fix everything. He comes to power and he's able to get the German people jobs because he takes them away from the Jews. And he takes them away from all the other people, the Roma that are there and, and all the other groups that he manages to get rid of. So he was a, there and got some power. And then he starts this aggressive militarism. So he's going to target Europe. Austria is going to become a part of the Third Reich in 1938. He's going to take Sudetenland, a uh, supporter of Czechoslovakia. Neville Chamberlain is the Prime Minister of Great Britain. He meets Hitler at the Munich Conference and basically makes Hitler feel okay. He gives into his demands for more land. And Hitler knew Europe was not going to stand up to him. So in 1939, he invades Czechoslovakia. He creates uh, the Air Force, the Luftwaffe, and invades the demilitarized Rhineland, as you can see in this map on the top right. He has a non-aggression pact with Stalin not to attack one another because they've been through enough through World War I. He promises Stalin Eastern Poland if he stood, stood by while Germany attacks. And then on September 1st, 1939, he invades Poland and World War II officially starts. So he goes back on his word. So now here we go. This is Hitler invading Poland on September 1st, 1939, the official start of World War II. So here we have what is known as Blitzkrieg. It's a lightning war. It was a swift way of war, and it was meant to end the war quickly. That's what he thought. This is what I'm going to do. He targets France with lightning speed. So... Then we have what is known as the Lend-Lease Act, 1941. So the U.S. doesn't really want to get involved, just like World War I. The U.S. is going to lend or lease war supplies, not sell them, to any nation deemed vital to the defense of the United States. This way, the United States stays neutral. And here we also talk about the Battle of Britain, which was July 10th to October 31st of 1940. And um, in the Battle of Britain, we have the Blitz, which was September 7, 1940 to May 11th of 1941. Um, during the Blitz, many children had to be moved out of the cities, and they were separated from their families and moved into uh, the countryside. And this actually happened to some of my family. And um, in the city, what they would do is they would make sure all their lights were out. So you had to board up your windows. If any light was on, when the, the German planes were flying over, that's when they would bomb that city because they would think, okay, that's a city, that's not a countryside. Because their idea was if there's no lights on in the city when that 
plane is flying over because they don't really have the radar that they of course have today knowing what's a city and what's countryside they're thinking well if i'm not seeing anything underneath me it must clearly just be a farm i'm not going to throw a bomb on a farm i want to hit the biggest cities so if there were lights on street lights building lights that sort of thing they would hit that so there was a lot of whenever the, the sun would start to set, that's when they would all board up their windows and make sure nobody could see that there were any lights on. So after three months of nonstop bombing, Britain's going to enhance its air force sufficiently to destroy German planes and end the bombing. So Hitler wants to destroy communism. Um, he, of course, doesn't like it. He likes his fascism. He's going to violate the non-aggression pact and invade the USSR in 1941. Uh, the Soviet winter. Of course, as, as a lot of people know, when you would uh, invade Soviet Russia or invade just Russia, it's a really bad idea. It's going to invade uh, a result, sorry, in a German loss at Stalingrad. This is a turning point in the war. And the Battle of Leningrad was also a German loss. Uh, One million dead Soviets. So, so it, was, it was bad for Soviets, but the Germans aren't doing so well. So... The U.S. is going to enter the war in 1941 after Pearl Harbor is um, attacked by the Japanese. Hitler is going to use this declaration of war on the U.S. because they declare war three days later as a propaganda tool because Hitler, Germany, they were suffering so many severe setbacks against the Soviets that their way of showing their strength to their people was, that's okay, don't worry, don't worry, we're doing so well, we're going to declare war on the United States. Not the smartest move, as we all know. So this is the Atlantic fight. <clears throat> the U.S. is fighting Europe, in Europe, in the Pacific, and in North Africa. Essentially, everyone's fighting for control over the Suez Canal. Um, this was access to oil from the Middle East and the raw materials from Asia. So allies needed control. Um, in the Battle of El Amin, uh, Desert Fox is essentially defeated in 1942. There's a clip in a Tom Cruise movie in the film where he's trying to assassinate Hitler that starts off in Africa right at the beginning. If we do have time in class, I will try to show it to you. Um, if not, I do encourage you to at least watch the beginning of it, um, but be careful there. I don't believe there's any curse words, but just in case. Just be careful. So, here we have the Allies are going to invade Italy, and they're going to take over Rome again on June 4th in 1944. And two days later, the Allies are going to invade France on what is known as D-Day. Germans are going to launch one last offensive against the Allies in the Battle of the Bulge. And the Allies in the USSR are basically going to close in on Berlin in the spring of 1945. And this, of course, is the inside the bunker where Hitler lived at the end of the war. Does not end well for Hitler. But now we got to go switch gears over to the Pacific Theater because Japan is still a huge thing in this whole war. So Jap Japanese are going to invade China, and we know that they're in conflict. So in 1931, they invade in the area of Manchuria. Remember, we just talked about that. Um, and remember, the Treaty of Portsmouth basically uh, ended the conflict between Japan and Russia. And it was this whole Manchuria issue. Well, in 1931, Japan decides they're going to take it. They take over Manchuria, and they call it Manchuko, M-A-N-C-H-U-K-U-O. And they control this area from 1932 to 1945. But China was unstable during this time. We talked about that. You know, they're still trying to get up the whole communist thing with Mao Zedong. So Japan saw this as the perfect opportunity to go in. Then in December of 1937 to January of 1938, soldiers of the Imperial Japanese Army murdered Chinese civilians, disarmed combatants, mass raped, looted, and committed mass murder in the rape of Nanking. Anywhere from 200,000 to 300,000 Chinese were murdered. Numbers, of course, are hard to come by as the Japanese and the Chinese report differently. So I have a couple battles on here. The Battle of the Coral Sea was uh, both Japan and allies are going to suffer losses. Uh, it did stop Japan from invading Australia. Then you have the Battle of Midway Island. Um, this was one month later, but six months after Pearl Harbor. This turning point in the Pacific War was when uh, Japan loses and having problems actually replacing their ships and replacing their men. 
And then you have the Guadalcanal. This was unlike the others because the others were naval battles. This was a major land offensive. Allies took this island back in February of 1943 because uh, the Japanese had actually occupied it since August of 1942. Then we have what is known as Oper Operation Downfall. This was actually just a proposed Allied plan to invade Japan um, because it was we were trying to like island hop our way towards Japan, but we keep killing our own people as a result of it. Um, but when Japan actually uh, surrenders, this is going to be completely abandoned. So Truman, uh, the president, he takes over after FDR dies. Uh, you know, the FDR held the presidency for such a long time that we had to put in a constitutional amendment that a president can only be president for up to eight years. Truman, by the way, never actually graduated college. Hmm. He makes the decision to use the atomic bomb as a means to end the war. Uh, Hiroshima was bombed on August 6, 1945, and Nagasaki was born on, uh, bombed sorry, on August 9, 1945. Then VJ Day, was, which is victory in Japan, takes place on August 14, 1945, when Japan surrenders. So just like World War I, this is a total war. There's propaganda, there's art, there's media, the populations are mo mobilized, everyone takes part in the war effort. This, of course, is Rosie the Riveter. Um, ideology is used to mobilize fascism, communism. We've got it on, you know, everywhere. And individual rights are suppressed during the conflict. Something we really want to talk about is the Japanese internment camps in America. And you'll talk about this a lot in American history, whether you take APUSH or not. Um, there were internment camps in Arkansas, actually. Uh, Japanese people were rounded up and basically shipped there. In they were taken away from their homes and they lost everything. They were shipped overnight, essentially told, leave your home, take bag, this is what you get. We also talk about the casualties of war and we'll also talk about the Ar Armenian genocide as well. So don't think we're only gonna talk about the Holocaust. Um, but 50 to 70 million people were killed in this time period. 400,000 Americans were killed in action. Six million in Asia were uh, died due to the Japanese war crimes. 11 million died in the Holocaust, uh, 6 million of them were Jews. Of course, you have to talk about gay people that were killed, Roma that were killed. Uh, Poland lost 16% of its population, and then 30 million soldiers and civilians died in the USSR. Then we do end up having the Yalta Conference. This was to negotiate the post-war world in February of 1945. Stalin is on the bottom right. He wanted a buffer between the USSR and Western Europe. FDR's in the middle. He wanted Eastern Europe to rule themselves. And then you have Churchill on the bottom left. All of them decide to agree. Churchill's, by the way, is British. Um, and they all decide to agree on a United Nations. This is going to be something that has a little bit more power than the League of Nations. We're going to fix everything. And then you have Potsdam, which is the second conference. So Churchill is no longer the Prime Minister of England. So you have Clement Attlee. He's on the top left. And Truman, of course, replaces FDR. He's in the middle after FDR dies of a stroke. And Stalin is one of the original three. This takes place in 1945. Now, look here. FDR wanted Eastern Europe to rule themselves. Truman wanted free elections in Eastern Europe. Kind of a different ideology, a different thought. So originally, Truman actually had written to his wife that he liked Stalin. But later, he becomes suspicious of Stalin's motives. And you have to remember, America wanted Germany to recover and become a trading partner, while Russia did not trust Germany at all. And they had many years to realize why they didn't trust Germany. Um, you know, they were fighting with them a long time, and America was overseas. Russia and Germany were very close. So they wanted a weak Germany, and they wanted to create a buffer zone of friendly states around Russia. And, of course, Truman is anti-communist, while Stalin is anti-capitalist. This is going to set up the Cold War, which we'll go into in Unit 8. So we do want to briefly mention this as well. This is very, very, very important. The League of Nations essentially gives the ruling power of Palestine to Britain from 1920 to 1948. That's why it says here that British had a mandate for Palestine until 1948. Well, the Balfour Declaration of 1917 
was a public statement issued by the British government for the establishment of a national home for the Jewish people. So after World War II, many Jews were displaced and many Jews didn't really have anywhere to go. So the purpose of Israel <clears throat> was to create a homeland for the Jews following the atrocities of the war. So this, of course, is going to set up, though, an enduring division between Palestinians and the state of Israel due to competing nationalism and land. So there were Palestinians that were already living there, and then Jews had nowhere to go. So Britain said, well, here we've got this land. We will help you create Israel. This is a very complicated issue. We will have chances to talk about this, especially in Unit 9. Um, there are plenty of things I can also give you to kind of help you listen and, and discern and to kind of break apart this very complicated issue because while you think, well, of course they need a land to go to, what about the Palestinians that already live there? And they constantly fight over pieces of land. It's very messy. Um, so we'll find time to break this apart at certain points during the remaining year. So don't worry, we will uh, get very messy with this. So if you have any questions, make sure you paused and wrote them down so we can talk about them in class. And of course, we're always available before and after school. And that is the end of our PowerPoints for Unit 7.